strategy initiative at the New America Foundation in Washington, D.C., and he's a national security analyst for CNN. He's been a research fellow at New York University's Center on Law and taught at the Kennedy School of Government. Among his many journalistic credits was producing Osama bin Laden's first television interview for CNN. He has a new book coming out, which is called The Longest War. It's due out in January from Simon & Schuster. We also have Paul Pilar. He is Director of Studies of the Security Studies Program at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He retired in 2005 from a 28-year career in the U.S. intelligence community, in which his last position was National Intelligence Officer for the Near East and South Asia. He also served in the National Intelligence Council. He's been Executive Assistant to the CIA's Deputy Director for Intelligence and Executive Assistant to the Director of Central Intelligence, William Webster. He's also a retired officer in the U.S. Army Reserve and served a tour of duty in Vietnam. He has a book coming out, um, The Mythology of Intelligence, from Columbia University Press, due out next spring. And finally, we have Steve Simon, who is just getting mic'd up. He's a senior fellow for Middle East Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and a former senior director for combating terrorism at the National Security Council. He's been a senior analyst at RAND, and he teaches at Georgetown University. Uh, he is also currently a senior advisor at the State Department for Counterterrorism. And he has two new books coming out. Um, one. The Sixth Crisis, U.S., Israel, Iran, and the Rumors of War. And the next one, which he said he'll inflict on us, what, 2012? Um, is the U.S. and the Middle East and in the Cold War. With that, I need a microphone. How's that? Cool. So, gentlemen, um, your first impressions. Can you each give me about three minutes on, you watch that. Um, as I'm watching it, I'm thinking, looks very foreign. Looks like it couldn't happen here. And yet we heard from the LA police chief this afternoon. He revamped his entire counterterrorism strategy after hearing of this attack. What are your impressions? Uh, off the cuff, <clears throat> off the cuff, I'd say uh, it could happen in the U.S., uh, but if it happened in a major American city, it probably wouldn't be as ugly because the response would be faster. I'm fairly confident uh, here. I mean, in this attack, it took about 10 hours for the special security forces. took about 10 hours for the security forces to arrive on the scene. And generally, this is the kind of thing you really want to nip in the bud, if you can do that. Um, and the Indians didn't do it. I suspect in an American city, that, you know, that would be more likely to happen. It might be difficult if the attack was carried out in much the same way, which is to say um, several groups all descending on different targets creates a problem uh, in trying to um, establish a cordon, uh, which is essential in these things. But um, I guess, uh, you know, the short answer is yes, but perhaps not as bad. Paul? Sure, it could happen there. Uh, for the basic reasons of uh, the inherent openness and vulnerability of public spaces, be they hotels or public transit systems or train stations. Uh, and although this particular operation by LT was obviously uh, well organized and well prepared, an awful lot of damage can be done even with things that are not nearly that well organized. And a lot of um, multiplying fear factor can work in the terrorist's favor, even beyond the number of deaths or the physical destruction. And the thing that comes to mind is the DC sniper case that those of us in Washington Remember from a few years ago, uh, you know, two misfits, uh, an old car and a rifle, 
and it, um, it, had, it caused an awful lot of disruption. So, I mean, I agree with Steve that um, uh, one would hope and one would expect that the response in our country would be better than what was being described by the Mumbai police, but the basic uh, inherent vulnerability is still there. And what we learned with Virginia Tech is it only takes five to eight minutes to take out sure. 30 people. So, Peter? You know, I mean, the, I, I agree completely with what Paul and, and Steve have said. Um, but for the Mumbai attack, A, you need to get 10 people into the country, and B, you'd have to get 10 people willing to commit suicide effectively. And so in the United States, um, it is hard to get people in, um, relatively speaking. Uh, the kinds of cases where we have seen people willing to die, uh, obviously Major Nadal Hassan was willing to die effectively in a sort of jihadi death by cop. Uh, he, he killed 13 people, not 170. Uh, there's a guy called Carlos Bledsoe, a case I'm very interested in, Little Rock, Arkansas who attacked a U.S. military recruiting station in uh, the middle of the day. He'd recently converted to Islam and gone to Yemen. Uh, he'd converted, his middle name that he'd taken uh, was Mujahid, which should have been a bit of a giveaway uh, since it's a pretty unusual name, uh, Holy Warrior. Um, and uh, he killed one person uh, and seriously wounded a soldier. So to assemble a, a, a unit of 10 uh, to do this kind of attack in the United States, I think would be pretty difficult. Two cases are, uh, might, are relevant. One is the Fort Dix case where you know, there were a group of guys who were going to attack a U.S. military base. They, were they willing to commit suicide? Who, who, who knows? And the other case that I think is very interesting is the Torrance, California case where you had four or five guys who were willing to take some risks and attack U.S. Uh, military recruiting stations and synagogues. So, you know, I, I think not only the points that Paul and Steve have made about the U.S. response, I just think recruiting that kind of group of pe people in the, in the States is pretty tricky. Well, I'd like to broaden it out. Um, I mentioned that LET is one of the groups that is considered a, a sort of cooperative member of uh, what Admiral Mullen referred to uh, last night as this synergy of terrorist groups that are working with Al Qaeda. Um, one of the things that intelligence analysts believe is over the past year, some of these groups uh, have started walking in lockstep with Al Qaeda in that they aspire to the same goals, global attacks, including attacks on the United States. Do you think that applies or do you think that's scaremongering? I think there is uh, something of a convergence and the convergence takes place on a number of levels. Uh, it takes place in that area of the world on the personal level because you have informal social networks and kinship relations um, uh, that kind of come together uh, in these uh, in these various groups in a way that makes it difficult to peel them apart, you know, forensically. Um, uh, there's a convergence operationally. Um, uh, so, for example, you get strange things happening like Abu Zubaydah, who is a kind of a major Al Qaeda figure, is arrested in an LET safe house. Um, you know, well, what's he doing there? Well, there's some kind of operational uh, convergence. And then you get this convergence that you were just alluding to at the ideological level. Uh, they all see themselves as more or less having the same enemy. Um, uh, and see uh, more or less the same tactics as A being effective and B being, you know, legitimate or, or religiously justifiable. So you do get this, um, I guess, uh, you know, synergy, as you put it, although the word synergy itself tends to suggest that they're really working um, together and sometimes that doesn't and happen. I I stole it from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, so didn't coin it myself. Well, no, I completely agree with everything he said. Okay. <laughs> um, Peter, just so that I don't leave you third every time, what do you think? <laughs> well, look, Bashkari Taiba was a group that was focused on India, and in the Mumbai attack, they specifically targeted uh, a Jewish American community center. They killed six Americans. They also, the guy, the CD that's mentioned in the film, was probably filmed by an American because uh, David Headley, a guy from Chicago, uh, traveled to Mumbai on uh, several occasions and basically did most of the video surveillance. So this is a group that was essentially focused on India, that now is attacking Westerners and Jews, and that is recruiting Americans to conduct its operations. So clearly, this is a different group in some ways than, than it was even several years ago. Amplifying something that Steve has said, 
this is not a new phenomenon in some senses in, in terms of their relations with Al Qaeda. Um, you know, when, when Clinton responded to the embassy attacks in, in, in Africa, uh, most of the people who died in the uh, Afghan training camps were not, not Al-Qaeda, but they were Harakat al-Mujahideen, which is a major Kashmiri group. So these groups have been you know, playing together for a long time. This is not a, a new phenomenon. But the fact that LET now sees itself as sort of playing in Al-Qaeda's you know, ideological space, that is new. Paul, you're a little bit more skeptical of this. Well, no, there certainly is the convergence in, <coughs> excuse me, and, and the, uh, the uh, synergy. But before we get too quick to kind of blur everything together into one um, scary uh, radical uh, picture, we should remember what the basic objectives are and the strategies that groups are pursuing. In the case of something like LT, it really goes all back to the Indo-Pakistani conflict and the conflict over Kashmir the all-consuming Indo-Pakistani conflict in terms of how so many people, especially on the Pakistani side, look at things. And once you get beyond that, then you're talking not so much about basic objectives, but rather about strategy for achieving those objectives. And even the transnational terrorists that we have focused on so much, of bin Laden and al-Qaeda, even they, when you get down to the most basic of objectives. It's not to see how many Americans they can kill. It has to do with changing the political order in the Middle East. And if bin Laden had any one wish of his to be granted tomorrow would be to overthrow the Saudi regime and have a new political order in his homeland of Saudi Arabia. Bin Laden's stroke of strategic genius as the early 90s went into the late 90s was this idea of hitting the far enemy as a way of or a strategy toward getting at the near enemy after there was the lack of success in overthrowing the near enemy, especially by groups like Zawahiri's uh, um, uh, portion of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. So when we're talking about Lashkar-e Taiba, it, it's really the same sort of thing. And I, 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 would, I would hesitate to describe these people as ones who have it somehow hardwired into their thinking that uh, killing Americans and Westerners in this transnational, global, jihadist sort of way is, is basic to what they're trying to do. Now, what's most basic are those conflicts back in South Asia. Um, yet we have um, senior defense analysts saying uh, right now that they see a fusion between al-Qaeda, um, the TTP, the Pakistani Taliban, and the Haqqani Network. Uh, with some LET participation, where these groups are working together, that it's partly because al-Qaeda has been driven to this as a matter of survival by the doubling in drone attacks and the increased direct action missions in Afghanistan, hitting them on both sides. So the question is, uh, we heard from CIA Director Leon Panetta over the weekend. He said that uh, al-Qaeda has never been weaker, and yet some critics say this fusion is actually going to make them stronger and harder to defeat. What do you think? Well, no, no doubt there is some operational advantage to each of these groups in the kind of cooperation we're talking about. And clearly the al-Qaeda leadership, bin Laden and Zawahiri specifically, have benefited from various forms of cooperation that have enabled them to remain at large for all these many years, uh, presumably in northwest Pakistan. That's a clear advantage in which the, um, uh, what we know of as the Pakistani Taliban seems to be most, most involved. Uh, but but I, I, I just caution that uh, we, 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 we should not equate fusion. Well, I, I don't like the word fusion because that, that tends to blur things all together. Operational cooperation, you know, some ideological convergence and similarity, but that's not really um, what I would call fusion. Um, Peter? Yeah, I mean, what's the difference is, uh, you know, the Pakistani Taliban sent suicide bombers to Barcelona in January of 08. Luckily, they were arrested. Uh, but that should have been an indicator the Pakistani Taliban were not going to just be concerned with local concerns. And so Faisal Shahzad, who was trained by the Pakistani Taliban, that's a lot less surprising once, you, once you've you know, realized that there is some history here. And, uh, you know, it's not the Pakistani Taliban is going to be sending tons of you know, car bombers to Manhattan, I don't think. 
um, but we were in a slightly different situation. The Taliban were a very provincial group of people when they ran Afghanistan. Mullah well, Omar, their leader, visited Kabul twice in the five years he ran the country. Um, they have now adopted al-Qaeda's ideology and tactics uh, to a large degree, which is one of the reasons we're, having, we're in the middle of the longest war in American history. Because if you look at what happened in Afghanistan, it was only in 05 that the Afghan Taliban started deploying suicide at, uh, tactics, uh, beheading hostages, employing a very sophisticated video uh, information operation campaign, a group that had banned television when they were in power. And they essentially took the Al-Qaeda playbook in Iraq and transferred it to the Afghan theater. And they did it by sending people to Iraq for on-the-job training, and there was some back and forth. So the, the Taliban is a different group than it was, you know, certainly when they were in power. And I think it's a lot to do with Al-Qaeda's influence. Does it make Al-Qaeda harder to defeat? I mean, we have uh, Director Panetta telling us Al-Qaeda's weaker, but I have counter analysis saying actually it's driven them as a matter of survival into closer cooperation with groups that could end up um, keeping them around longer. Well, here's where the blurring of boundaries does become somewhat important. And, uh, you know, I agree with Paul, we shouldn't be exaggerating the situation, but um, the operational and to some extent strategic convergence uh, that we're looking at um, uh, is going to give al-Qaeda a new lease on life in a somewhat, you know, different form embedded in a bigger network of organizations that, um, you know, have converged around these, around these principles. And there are strange things happening in this context. So, for example, you know, you get LET now operating in Afghanistan. Well, this was uh, a Kashmiri group that was aimed at India, and their focus was very much in Kashmir. Now they're operating in an area where they come into very intimate contact with the Taliban and the Haqqani network uh, and al-Qaeda. Um, and, you know, the, the, the innovation I see, uh, you know, resulting from this, so the new dispensation, if I can put it that way, is that whereas, you know, for al-Qaeda, the battle was very much against the far enemy, as, as Paul indicated. Uh, here you have two things happening at once. You get this battle against the, for, the far enemy, but there's also a battle against the near enemy simultaneously. And, um, you know, this, uh, you know, reflects a kind of ambition and audacity that you didn't really even see with Al-Qaeda alone. I mean, they thought it was futile to attack the near enemy. The near enemy was too strong unless the, far, the support of the far enemy was undermined through attacks on the far enemy. These guys are attacking both at the same time. And I think that's, um, uh, that's uh, you know, something that we need to, to worry about, um, you know, and, and it's different. Kimberly, I, I don't think there's as much disagreement as might seem at first blush you know, between Director Panetta and what my colleagues are saying and, or, and what I'm saying. Um, and this gets to how you define al-Qaeda. Uh, I think Director Panetta is right if you define al-Qaeda as the way I use the term, the particular group led by bin Laden and Zawahiri, you know, al-Qaeda central AQC. I think it probably is weaker. Uh, but I also agree, you know, as Peter pointed out, that we do have to worry about groups like LT. Um, even if it's, in my terms, you know, not fundamental objective, but a, a strategy for achieving their objective. Uh, we still have to worry about it. Uh, the way the term al-Qaeda, of course, more often gets used is in a more loose, general way to kind of refer to the whole movement. And, you know, the, the legitimate basis for that is going back to bin Laden's initial ideas of what the base al-Qaeda literally means. That is, that his own group wouldn't try to accomplish it all. So I agree that to the extent that it's LT or somebody else that has gotten into this transnational terrorist business, for whatever strategic reasons it may be, one, we have to worry about it, and two, it does serve bin Laden's purposes, even if it's not al-Qaeda central. So slightly weaker, but also a new lease on life. Slightly weaker as far as the core group is concerned, but in terms of what we need to worry about with regard to threats from 
whatever part of the larger movement, uh, not necessarily weaker at all. I'd like to open it up to the crowd. Um, and you got your hand up first, so let's see if we can get the microphone to you. Is working? Yeah. Indeed. Uh, can you just tell uh, us who like you are? I would like the panelists to comment on the elephant in the bedroom. Uh, this was random murder of random people, except for what was omitted from this movie, which, as Peter briefly brought up, was the Chabad Center that was particularly targeted, not mentioned whatsoever in this movie. Oh, no, it's mentioned in this movie in, in great detail. We just had to cut an hour-long-plus movie down. I'm very Sorry. gratified to hear that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's moment by moment. They interviewed the, um, in the Chabad Center, uh, the Jewish uh, center that was attacked. Um, they killed the rabbi and his wife, and the nanny was able to hide. Get away with, with the baby. The, baby. The, the point being that everything was random except that group. And, and that, I, I think, diminishes a little bit about what the gentleman in the center said, that this was Indo-Pakistani and so forth. Uh, whenever there's an Indo-Pakistani dispute going on, there's always room for the Jews. There's always room to pick out the Jews specifically and to try and murder them because they're Jewish. I'd like comments. The, uh, the, there was an intercepted... A phone conversation uh, in which can you hear me? Hello. Um, there was uh, there was an intercepted cell phone conversation. One of the hundreds uh, that we heard about in the movie, in which the one of the teams was instructed to carry out the attack on Naraman House. Uh, with the objective of disrupting or interfering somehow in the Israeli-Indian relationship. So judging uh, by that instruction, uh, the inclusion of Chabad House as a target uh, does fit somewhat comfortably into uh, Paul's construct. Um, uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, and, and this is not you know, th these explanations are not mutually exclusive, but the ideological convergence um, that we're talking about uh, could also explain the targeting by LET, which had previously not focused on Jews, um, of Nariman House in, uh, in the attack. I think it probably goes, goes beyond that, in, in addition to the specific thing about Israeli-Indian relations. Uh, zeroing in on a Jewish target which they clearly did, you're quite correct, uh, serves the same sort of purpose uh, in a slightly different way that hitting the far enemy, the main far enemy, the United States does. And it's the same reason bin Laden, uh, in his propaganda, you know, refers very often to Israeli Arab uh, issues, even though that's not his core concern, but it serves his purpose. So. I think in the same way, in addition to the more specific reason that uh, Steve mentioned, it, LT saw it as serving that purpose as well, uh, which is to say um, hitting something that uh, they hope will have resonance uh, in their Muslim constituency. Um, Ma'am in the sweater, the microphone is coming your way. Hi. Um, this question is directed primarily to uh, Mr. Bergen, but I'd like you both to address it if possible. Uh, in the report that the New America Foundation put out, you discussed that in the aftermath of the drone campaigns, violence has pretty much continued unabated. Do you think that the Predator and Reaper attacks have also pushed groups like LET? Um, and the other Pakistani militant groups closer towards Al Qaeda and the Taliban? Well, you know, it's hard to tell. I mean, one thing is, you know, the tribal regions where the drone attacks are happening are one of the more opaque regions in the world. In fact, we're, gonna, we're in the middle of undertaking uh, the first independent poll in the FATA to try and find out what people really think, because my intuition is the that they're less uh, unpopular in the tribal regions where the drones are happening than they are perhaps in Karachi. So, because, you know, if a bunch of heavily armed religious nutcases moved into your neighborhood and some of them were taken out by 
pieces of metal falling from the sky, you wouldn't be too unhappy either. So the fact is, is that the Taliban is not embraced uh, wholeheartedly in the, in the tribal regions. Uh, they're just the, you know, the strongest group there. As to your question, you know, is the dr are the drones put pulling these people closer together? I think it's very hard to tell. They've had some effect on these groups. David Rhodes' account of his kidnapping, he, he, gives, you know, he was kidnapped for nine months by the Haqqani network. He, you know, he was with these guys a great deal of the time, and he says the, the drones were a constant fear for these guys. However, if the drones were so effective, why is it, as you, say, you mentioned in your question, that the violence in Pakistan is at epic levels uh, last year, and the violence in Afghanistan? After all, much of this violence emanates from this region. So the drones are merely a tactic, they're not a strategy. Um, and I think there are you know, a number of questions about them. The civilian casualty rate is one question. I think it's much lower than some people presume. Um, but you know, the reason we're doing it is we have no other options. Uh, you know, the 82nd Airborne is not going to go into the tribal regions unless there is an attack in Times Square that kills several hundred people, or we know that we can capture bin Laden. So, gentlemen, do you think the um, death from the sky, as it's been called in some editorials, is causing more trouble, radicalizing these groups further? Well, you know, it's kind of an on-balance question. Uh, what, you know, what's, what's the on-balance uh, result? And I just think it's really too early to say. Um, the Al-Qaeda leadership uh, has, to all appearances, been largely decimated, except for the War Council, which is in hiding in Pakistan, as as uh, the, the chairman uh, said uh, yesterday in his remarks. Um, and no doubt uh, some people are alienated uh, by this and it's radicalized them and perhaps uh, they're now contributing to the fight against the United States. You know, the thing is there's no turnstile uh, with a little counter in it that enables you um, uh, really to tell. I mean, my own view is, is different to some extent um, uh, from Peter's. I think if we're worried about Al-Qaeda, and that's the reason we're there, well, you know, the way we're killing them is with these, you know, with these missiles uh, launched from predators and reapers. This administration has uh, greatly increased its commitment uh, to this way of, of fighting the war, uh, largely because, as Peter points out, uh, you know, what What's the alternative? I mean, you can't imagine it. Forget about the 82nd Airborne. You can't imagine some guys from the Bureau driving up in a Crown Vic, um, you know, to arrest these guys. Uh, the only way to do it uh, is really uh, with Predator. So, you know, I think if you if you stop using Predator, then you really have to ask yourself, how are you going to deal with the problem that you say you entered Afghanistan to deal with? And that becomes a question, to my mind, that's too hard to answer. The drone strikes are probably the best example of how a counter-terrorist tool can have both positive and negative effects, and it is a matter of weighing uh, the one against the other. In this particular case, it's primarily a short-term versus long-term. The short-term benefit is taking bad guys out of commission right away, and given that you can't drive the Crown Vic uh, and arrest them. Uh, the longer term uh, disadvantage, which uh, has to be weighed, is, is the anti-American sentiment that it breeds, uh, not just in the country in which you're doing the operations, but through the uh, uh, miracle of modern uh, mass communications, uh, the message it sends elsewhere. Well, it strikes me that the lack of information operations surrounding these attacks is actually also proving harmful in that you know, they're not also, um, there's no press officer afterwards saying, we actually killed X number of civilians and X number of combatants as they try to do right away in Afghanistan. Um, so if there were some way to push back on some of these figures, but. Yeah, I mean, the era of plausible deniability on this is long past. I mean, there are Google, <laughs> Google pictures of these um, drones at their bases in Pakistan published by the London Sunday Times. Diane Feinstein said it's, you know, these things are coming out of Pakistan. And, and Director Panetta confirmed this weekend that the CIA took out the number three. That was, to my knowledge, the first direct confirmation from an official of a drone strike against an al-Qaeda 
Leader. I think it would be very, if indeed the civilian casualty rate is close to 5%, which is the administration point of view, which I think may be true. If you look at the open source right now, the ca civilian casualty rate is about 10% based on reliable media reporting, down from about 30% in, 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 under the Bush administration. If that's the case, we have a pretty good story to tell. Uh, and the, you know, the fact is that we're doing this with a great deal of Pakistani cooperation. I was in Pakistan when Bayatullah Massoud was killed, who after all is responsible for the deaths of literally thousands of Pakistani civilians. And the lead headline was, uh, when he died, was killer Bayatullah good riddance and dawned the quality English language newspaper. So there's, no simp there's quite a lot of understanding in Pakistan that this is not a bad thing, particularly amongst the elite. So the, you know, the, we're giving a tiny fig leaf to the Pakistani government, which allow, the, the, but even this fig leaf isn't, doesn't really uh, amount to much at this point, and I think that you know, as our strategic interests and theirs are more closely aligned than ha they have been in the past, the drones is a very good example of that, where we're killing their enemies with their information. Well, the U.S. policymakers, are you listening? Um, we'll take a couple more questions before I get you all to bed, so you get some sleep before Mr. Leiter in the morning. Sir, this little snippet that we watched, what does that say about the? the strategies of trying to address the long-term issues that uh, are thought to be uh, responsible for the recruitment and radicalization kind of thing. It, it would suggest to me that we'd be hard-pressed to overcome the sort of recruitment program that was uh, uh, brought out in the interview. What's your thoughts on that, Paul? It suggests more so to me, and this gets back to our earlier comments in response to Kimberly's first question, that given the inherent limitations of trying to you know, protect us at the point of attack, getting back to the notion of open society and how easy it is to hit comparable targets here in our own country, that we have to, none, notwithstanding the difficulty that you are alluding to in countering the recruitment message, that has to be a major focus of our counterterrorist strategy, which, which it is. I think we hear more and more about, you know, we need a counter narrative, we need to do a better job of that. Um, because ultimately, it's, it's going to come down to fewer people getting recruited into a group like that to accomplish that sort of mission, as opposed to accepting that there are going to be a bunch of those people and trying to find defensive security measures to keep them from accomplishing their mission. Well, I just want to um, wrap up with one final question. I keep hearing from counterterrorism officials in background settings, somehow they don't like to go on the record with this, though I'll try with Mr. Leiter tomorrow, that we in the American public expect too much. We expect 100% safety, um, whereas perhaps we have to accept, as they do in Israel, that terrorism is now a part of our life. True? How do you sell that one? You know, I don't think it's actually all that hard to sell. Um, you know, on, on one level, Americans, like other populations um, in, within the West and, and outside of it, can adapt pretty quickly to some seriously bad things happening. Um, you know, the sniper attacks uh, depressed economic activity, actually, uh, in the area in which the snipers were operating. Um, uh, for a while, the snipers were ultimately caught, and, you know, I, I didn't notice any long-lasting damage uh, to the American psyche. Uh, the markets uh, are relatively insensitive to these things. After 2001, if, if I can tell a 25 words or less anecdote, after 2001, I, I I was uh, sent around to brief uh, Goldman Sachs offices in various, you know, in the flesh pots of Europe, basically. Um, and, uh, you know, I was uh, welcomed warmly in their offices, but they were completely indifferent to what I had to brief because, you know, for them, the 9-11 attack was, uh, was trivial. Uh, you know, we, uh, we lost a few traders. Yeah, okay. 
But, um, you know, we'll get over it. And shortly after that, this is, you know, part two of this one, you know, anecdote. I spoke to the American Board of Realtors. They had a big convention. And we were talking about real estate values in New York. And, uh, you know, I allowed us how, you know, the 9-11 attack must have some kind of serious effect on this. And they said, no, no, maybe if there were another, you know, one or two attacks like it, Manhattan housing values would drop. But so far, you know, things were looking pretty robust. So, you know, I think we can probably, uh, you know, absorb a hit or two. And yet to listen to members of the media, you, you know, for the slightest offense, uh, you'd think that you know, half the cabinet should be fired. Paul? What, what you say, uh, Kimberly, is absolutely true. I think it's somewhat harder to sell than Steve may be suggesting. Uh, with the right kind of leadership, you can sell it to some extent. But it is political poison for any politician or political leader or senior official to say anything that sounds like acceptance of anything less than perfection in counterterrorism. It sounds like an acquiescence in and acceptance of failure. Um, and that, I think, is one respect in which Americans tend to be different from Europeans and Israelis and others. And this gets back to American exceptionalism. Uh, Tocqueville observed when he was touring this country the American belief in the indefinite or infinite perfectibility of man. And we also, as Americans, seem to believe in the infinite perfectibility of our institutions. And that we have something like a terrorist attack, we believe that if we can just find the right fixes and the right reform, and the right law, or the right reorganization, it's not going to happen again. And it's going to be awfully hard to wean Americans away from that sort of belief. Yeah, I think President Obama has to make the following speech. It's a very difficult speech to make, but he obviously has the talent to do it, which is essentially to say, you know, Al-Qaeda is not 10 feet high. These guys don't re represent uh, World War IV or anything like it. They're not an existential threat to our way of life. They probably will get one through by the law of averages or somebody allied to them. Uh, we are doing as much as we can to protect you. That is a very hard speech to give as a politician, but if you give it after the event, it's impossible. And since we all agree that it's likely to happen in some shape or form, you know, Faisal Shahzad will get through one day and kill several dozen people in New York, you know, probably in the night, maybe within the first, Obama's, uh, you know, within this term. Um, and I think they must be keenly aware of that. They, you know, um, after um, 253, the Christmas Day plot, uh, Obama told his cabinet that we dodged a bullet. I think, it, you know, if, if that had succeeded, along, along with 253 blowing up, the Obama presidency would have blown up as well. So, you know, they are conscious of this, but that speech needs to be given. I mean, we need to kind of have a more adult conversation with the American people, because I think Kimberly were completely right and I agree with Paul. There is a sort of zero tolerance now for even failed attacks, let alone one that would be successful. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for coming here tonight. And um, also, uh, on a personal note, as the um, survivor of an Al-Qaeda splinter group's car bomb, um, I want to thank the Aspen Institute for sponsoring this forum and spurring this kind of debate. And thanks to all of you for staying late tonight. Thank you. Thank you.